old. And my earliest inception would be my first wife, who upon me coming home from prison, she gave me an ultimatum to either read or she leaves. And needless to say, I was doing a lot of stuff in the streets that most people do when they lack any resources and knowledge, especially a proper and conducive family setting. So in turn, when I came home, she was devastated, having had to stay out there with our daughter by herself. Of course, by that time when I got locked up, I thought I was never gonna get locked up again. That didn't mean I was gonna do more positive, it just meant that I thought I was gonna be more slick. So when I came home, she basically said, listen, um, I'm gonna either leave or you wanna read. I'm like, read what? She's like, look, I'm gonna work two jobs. I already uh, got put on to both. I'm gonna give you one check so you can just stay and read as much as material I give you. Because I believe in you and I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. And I believe in enough time, you'll find yourself and we'll both be able to transcend the depths of poverty. And of course, she wasn't an avid reader herself. So I was just wondering, where's this idea coming from? But she said she was just meditating and introspecting and she did this for so long. The only thing that she could come to terms with was maybe knowledge could get us out of this. So she gave me a number of books, you know, the mind book, your potential. <clears throat> I read some Francis Chris Wilson books, some John Henry Clark books. I read um, Dr. Ben books. I read a lot of books on history, the Moors, health, you know, spirit and soul, eternal life, eternal death. I read so many different books, Jesus found in Egypt. I read so many different books that in due time, I really, decided to change my dietary regimen changed um it wasn't the most impressive but it was a change nonetheless and in time one event led to the next and i would eventually start writing my own books people were loving the way i would present or deliberate when it came to my ideas and how i was articulating what i was learning and in time i would wind up teaching teaching became lecture and lecturing became more refined, so I started doing PowerPoint presentations, then eventually I started doing PowerPoint presentations on books that I was writing. And I developed an audience, I wound up having bookstores. I filled my bookstore with my books. So up to present date, I've written over 90 books. And I was able to put at one time, 30 plus of my books in the store. Uh, since then, I've had, I have my own publication company. And at that time, I had opened up a restaurant, Avalon Alkaline, a vegan restaurant in bed uh, At one point, I had four bookstores. I was also making soap, lotion, deodorant, hair grease, body spray, even our own diapers from hand. Just breaking down the science of why the diapers that we get from the stores is dangerous. And it was just a domino effect. I've evolved. Every two, three years, I was just on to something else. The more you learn, the less you know. And that's what I came to terms with. Like. As much as knowledge as I kept grasping and grabbing for, the more I kept realizing, dang, I really don't know nothing. Every time I kept learning something and it became very exciting. So the way a child would play a video game for 10, 15 hours, the someone has to say stop. That's how I got when I got conscious. I couldn't believe the vast supply of information that was just out here and how so many people of the same demographic would not even know, <laughs> you know, it was like, this information isn't really the hardest thing to assess. We're not exactly in the times of Marcus Garvey or Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We're in a very technological era. This information, for the most part, is easily accessible once someone puts you on the right path. And it was very scary to find out that the difference between the life I was living, which was ultimately gonna to turn to death or heavy incarceration, or the progressive lifestyle that I'm living today, the only difference or distinction would be the connect between the right information and the poor information, you know? And that's why I'm on Boss Mode right now, because I realized that the best thing that I could do would be to demonstrate that which I know by example. So it's not enough to just be able to educate brothers and sisters on what's the right thing to do. I need to show them what it looks like <clears throat> once you do the right thing. That's what I'm into. So sometimes people say, man, I'm materialistic. I'm buying cars <clears throat> that cost 150 grand to $300,000. 
all straight out on, on all my cars, you know, but I've also learned anything that I spend a lot of money on, it stands to reason that I should also be able to monetize it, turn it into a business. So I bought so many cars, I started renting my cars out. So yeah, people are half right, or it's a half truth when they say I'm driving around in car rentals. These are my cars and I rent them out. <laughs> okay, so $2,500 deposit, uh, $2,000 you get for a day, five hours after every 50 miles. You know, because I bought so many cars, it made sense for me to rent them out, turn it into a business. I go to a lot of basketball games, I sit courtside. So what I wound up doing, I learned uh, from Mayweather as well, just going to games and seeing TMT on the floor. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what does this really mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And of course, bumping into him and several other individuals over and over after a while. Shout out to him. He's a phenomenal person. Uh, as in, in real life, he's actually a very dope uh, brother. You know, a lot of the bravado and everything that he does is for branding. But he's a very, very intellectual brother. And he's way more smarter than people give him credit for. You know, uh, our measure of intelligence shouldn't always be exclusive to what college degree or credentials you have. Could that be the case? I wouldn't be too bright myself because I dropped out of school 10th grade, but I realized I'm in a great company with a lot of people who don't have credentials, who hire people who do to run their businesses. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it, this uh, food game works right now. A lot of people who have not put themselves to task to go through several degrees in school, uh, they may not have the accolades. However, they hire the people who do have them and they happen to be the bosses at the end of the day. Like the person who runs the hospital or owns the hospital, I doubt they're able to make incisions in people's bodies to perform surgery, but they own the hospital and they make their monies nonetheless. This is just the reality. You know, a lot of the companies that are owned, they are owned by people who are not, or who haven't made suitable proficiency in the preceding degrees to get the accolades or the credentials thereof in order for them to facilitate that particular means. That's just the way it, it works. But this is not a knock towards people who go to school and get the degrees. We need you as well. It's, it's where you find yourself. Some things is just not for everybody, but nonetheless, everyone has the right opportunity and the potential to succeed. So I went to basketball games and I realized I could rent out the seats. And so when I'm not at the game, I'm making money. And then sometimes I may go to a lesser seat that's course side because my course side seat is making money. And the person who buys into that just bought their ticket, bought my ticket, and I still get a little profit. So like when Kobe Bryant retired, it was like stocks going up. Once he said he was retiring for the rest of that season, man, my seats was 8,000, even 10,000 plus at times. And I learned that because I put so much money going to the games, why not make money off of it? So some people just look at me and they think, oh, he's just buying a bunch of cars, not knowing I also rent my cars out. He's going to a bunch of games. Why don't you make your money? You're giving the white man all that money, but not realizing I rent my seats out at the games. You know, while I'm here right now and the Clippers game is going on, I'm making money. And before I came here to Atlanta, which I just came from Ohio from a real estate development endeavor that I have with my partner, prior to that, my last day in LA, I was at the Clippers game. A few hours later, I flew out to Ohio, stayed in Ohio for 48 hours, came out here working on uh, Victoria Lamont's EPK as I also manage artists now, because I mentor so many people in sports, music, and entertainment who say, yo, anything you need, Polite, I got you. I say, you know what I can do? I can leverage my relationships with these celebrities and <clears throat> very successful brothers and sisters. And what I can do is find talent and then I can barter or network with these people. I don't necessarily have to ask people for $5,000 or $10,000. It's a, yo, studio time. Oh, you know what? I appreciate the fact you feel empowered or have been empowered by my message of holistic health or real estate or whatever the case may be when I'm mentoring. What you can do for me in exchange is get your artists to collaborate with my artists. So people who are jealous and frustrated with their situation say, I'm just doing nothing but photo ops. I'm a groupie. I've never seen a groupie able to get as much as pictures in people's homes <laughs> like I have. Or at a certain events, you know, boobies, it's a, there's an expiration or a limitation to what they're able to accomplish by photo ops, you know? I, but this is what you gotta deal with with our people at the end of the day. 
But what I've learned was how to leverage those relationships and not have a linear approach towards what my skill set is, but to realize in whatever atmosphere I'm in, how I could possibly diversify my talent. So though I write, I never limit myself to just writing. So now I've been able to do lectures and presentations and PowerPoints on it, but I never stopped there. I went as far as going to other countries to excavate for knowledge and then give firsthand accounts, empirical data based on my own photography or my own team. When we go to Egypt, when we go to Israel, when we go to Ethiopia, when we go to South Africa, and then I do debates. But I'm coming from an immediate experience. And then when I write my books, now I can address things that are important to our culture, but we normally were subject to the likes of whom may not have our ideals or our better interests at hand when they go and they ferret for truths or they look to do research. We normally had to pick through what other people presented to us in their scholarship. Now, when I go into the countries myself, I can say, man, this is a subject matter I'm interested in. This is the conversation in our community and I can bring it to the forefront and I can expound on it because I can show you the hieroglyphs because I go into pyramids myself and then now there's a new narrative because there's a conversation that transcends or e escapes or evades that of the conventional conversation that has to be redundant at times because we're only going to keep revisiting whatever is there that has been written about. So I took it to the next level and I started going to these countries and then documenting it and then putting it into my publications, doing my own translations. And now new conversation is being brought about. See, I took it that distance. I'm never satisfied with just the conventional approach. And, but I didn't want to be known exclusively as a debater or just a researcher. So I took that skill set. And when the opportunity presented itself, I found myself in California, Hollywood. Now I'm doing screenplays. Now I'm ghostwriting for people. Okay. And I also write music for people now. I don't sing, but I write songs for people to sing. And I also write for people that rhyme. You feel me? So my mentorship turned to management. My writing, as far as research and scholarship is concerned, now is screenplays. And now I'm working on historical novels and even contributing to certain TV shows content. But I embed those TV shows content with historically relevant data. So it can be some kind of satire, some kind of truth being disseminated in the midst of all the joking that's taking place. You know, any way that I could be effective in raising the consciousness of people, I don't have to have a linear approach and isolate myself as a leader where now I have to be uh, assassinated, <laughs> incarcerated because I felt that coming. So when I told people I retired, I retired from doing things the conventional way because I've seen my own people being turned against me. And I said, I've seen this before. I know what happens when you stand on a, a Amtrak and we know how fast the Amtrak goes and it's on schedule. I'm on schedule to be here if I stand on that track. It's inevitable. We've seen it with every other leader. So I said, what I'm gonna do is see if I can influence the influential. People have millions of followers. Let me see if I can plant a seed of truth in their mind. They don't have to do a total 360. They don't have to do a full reformation. What can happen is they say something that's prominent, something that's real, something that's motivational, something that provokes thought, and we on to the next one. And if we can repeat that process amongst several people who have millions of followers, then maybe in fact, I can provoke change inadvertently or vicariously through the likes of whom I'm impressing that have a large audience. So I don't have to always be the one, the figurehead, so to speak, that when it's time to kill the message, you kill me and everything's gone. So I'm like, I'm going to produce a body of work that exists in the minds and the hearts of people that's influential, that exists through the 90 plus books that I've written, through the various DVDs that I've done, through countless amount of live streams, tons of different interviews, through historical novels, <clears throat> through contributing content to different film and shows. And I, by the time I'm done, I know I've affected the world. You feel me? So I just don't want to just be standing out there on the stage until someone kills me or gets me locked up. I just, I see it and our people fall for it all the time. And, I, and my children are always worry about me because they watch Malcolm X and then they look at me. They watch the videos, you know, by Denzel Washington. They watch the movie with Denzel and they get this eerie feeling. And I'm not saying I'm Malcolm. You feel me? I'm brother polite. But we understand that me coming from a gang banging background, 
I've never felt more pressure on me to get murdered or incarcerated than when I became an activist. <laughs> never. You know, I never felt this heat or this lean towards people who want me dead when I was a gangbanger. I, I never felt the stress that's incurred for me being an activist as a gangbanger. It's a whole different thing. So that's why even my concept was gangster change. The whole definition change for what's gangster. You know, if this if gangster really was in a dictionary by our standard, it would have a whole new colloquial meaning. All right, because gangsters being an activist. Gangsters knowing that you're teaching the truth, that <clears throat> there's powers that have that are wealthy enough and strong enough to plant people to spy on you, to create insurrections inside of your organizations, to create distrust, discord within your organization to have people turn you. Marcus Garvey was called a fraud. And people fell for it despite everything he's contributed to his community. Many people don't even know Malcolm Marcus Garvey attempted to kill himself twice because he was overwhelmed by the amount of people that turned on him despite his UNIA organization, despite him coming out with his own publications, independent newspapers, Black Star Line, imported exports, and then not even knowing that the government sabotaged his ships, sabotaged his ships. But when people wasn't getting paid and funds was being misappropriated, we now can find out because of the Freedom of Information Act <clears throat> that the government sabotaged his mission and black people fell for it and turned against that black man. Today, we will highly revere him, but we will turn on the present day leader when the same thing is transpiring. We would revere Marcus Garvey because he's dead. And we will revere Most Honorable Lash Muhammad because he's dead. And this man had his own uh, imports coming in exports with fish. Muhammad Farms had his own independent publication in state houses, his own schools. But guess what? <clears throat> At that time, black people turned on him. Today, we celebrate that black man. I know how it goes. I know the narrative. So when people tell me, yo, you, you could be the next one up to bat, or you could, no, I don't want to be none of that because I know what you do to your own leaders. I don't want nothing to do with none of that. <laughs> I mean, it's a fact. You know why? Because I don't want to leave this world and make so much sacrifice for my people that I didn't even get to enjoy the world that I lived in. I, I'm going to drive the nice car because I want to. I've been cheated out of my childhood. My father left me at age eight. My mom died the week I met her when I turned 17 from cancer and diabetes. I, I ain't know much of nobody in my family. I was homeless. I was in shelters. I was in juvenile detention. I was in Rikers for attempted murder, locked up for murder. This is my life. Most of my life, I was locked up. Most of my life. You feel me? And then when I did go to school, I had to drop out because I was treated like a criminal whenever I had to go to my friends and family's house on account of the fact that I had to shower over there because I had a place to shower. So I was treated like a criminal. Like, why does a young man don't have a place to shower? I say, man, I use your bathroom. And then the moms would come in. My man's mom would put her finger over the mirror and see the condensation. Like, yo, is this dude showering in here? I was treated like a vagabond. Like I did something wrong. You know, I was doing is looking to survive from one day to the next. And I had people that could have just afford to allow me to sleep on a, the space on the floor that I would take up, depending on my height. I said, I don't even need nothing other than a space on your floor. And not even family would give me that space on the floor. You feel me? So that's where I come from. So I have no childhood. I spent my childhood on the streets or locked up somewhere. Very rarely did I have my own space. So when I started getting bread, and that's why I still have an affinity and a connection to my brothers in the streets. So I'm still low. I still love my brothers uh, from the 90s, from the 9 ounce that's crib, because I had to go to them to survive. You feel me? It's a jungle out there. We in animal mode. They'll tell you. People say, man, when I say, yo, it's animals in the hood, people be like, man, you can't call them animals, but you call yourselves bitches, motherfuckers, hoes, sluts, and everything. But when brother polite say, yo, we act like animals in the hood. We like, there's animals in the hood. It's a problem, but your, your own man's gonna tell you, I'm going beast mode, or I'm gorilla. Yo, son, I go eat. But when brother polite says something, we're gonna be super critical. It's animalistic. We got parts of our brain, the limbic system, the mammal brain. It's the same cells that a monkey has. Same cells that a monkey has in our brain. We have several brains. So we have the limbic system, which is the mammal brain. We have the brain stem, which is the reptilian brain, because the same cells that the reptilians have in their brain. And when we're reduced to a lowly standard, lack of resources, limited on education, limited on nutrition, we will be more responsive to our animal aspect as opposed to our cerebral cortex or the human brain as they call it. 
We're going to identify and connect more with the animalistic part of ourselves. We're still animals. We're in the animal kingdom. These are all facts. We're in the animal kingdom. So let's call a spade a spade. Let's call a spade a spade. You feel me? Let's let's not deviate from the truth. We are in the animal kingdom. So if I got a brainstem, if I got a brainstem, and that's the same cells that a reptilian has, and I have a limbic system, <clears throat> okay? And those are the same cells that a monkey has in their brain. Only difference is the human being's one is larger. That's the only difference. So if I have the same brain as a mammal, limbic system, the same brain as a reptilian brainstem, then it stands to reason if I get shortchanged in life or I come into this world limited on resources, if I come into this world limited on knowledge, what you think I'm going to behave like when you pack me into small places and call it a project and it's supposed to be my domestic dwelling? What you think I'm going to act like when you take any animal out there in vibe because human beings are part of the animal kingdom. I don't care how much you cut your nails and you cut your hair. Stop cutting your nails for a whole month and a half. Stop cutting your hair for a whole month and a half. Stop grooming yourself. And you see who you are. You see where you come from. You got Caucasians. Over 20% of Caucasians are still born with an extended spinal column, cockex tail. They actually still born with a tail. They're still born with a tail. And what you think you breathing in when you submerge in water when you're in the womb of your mother? Come on, man. Only body that can breathe in underwater. They are the amphibians, they got gills, something. Come on, you go through these different stages, but you don't want to deal with the facts that your hands are webbed. Come on, you got webbed hands. You just got to keep it real. We're animals. We just sophisticated. We cut our nails. We, we line our shit up. You know what I'm saying? We, we write books. We do film. And we feel like, you know, we, we're not animals. But let you not have resources. Let you not have the right amount of money. You have to start making decisions when it comes time to feed your family. Or you don't want to lose your wife because she put pressure on you to make money. And you, and you see other men are able to probably do more. She can see other men able to do more. And you like, it's between me getting rich or die trying. You hear what the homies say when they come out with their albums? We got to turn beast mode. We got to turn to animals. That's what it is. And the only distinction is the education. The only difference is the education. That's the only thing separating us from all the other animals. It's our ability to assimilate data. And that was the only difference with me. So I was an animal, straight up and down. And I'll go animal again if I have no resources. Because I'm not the type that's going to sit here and just be poor and have nothing. I'm not the type. I'm not going to eat out of a trash can. So some women is going to prostitute and some brothers are going to sell drugs. And I understand the plight. I don't condone the behavior. If I do it, I don't condone it. If they do it, I don't condone it. But I understand it. And I'm not going to tell you, stop prostituting and stop selling drugs either. I'm going to tell you I understand it and I got to find a way to give you enough knowledge so you can transcend that behavior. That's what I do. But I'd be damned if I just tell you stop and don't give you nothing in place of it. I can't do that because I come from that. I cannot do that. I come from that. I'll never do that again. <clears throat> it's just not, this is not being realistic. So I have a responsibility. When we're talking about boss mode, boss mode is me monetizing my life for the benefit of my people while I may benefit as well. So that's reciprocity. This is what we call in ancient Egypt, my eye. Reciprocity is that which is mutual, mutually beneficial to both parties. I gotta make sure whatever I do is mutually beneficial. So I do consultations, I get paid for them. Oh, you charging your people for knowledge. How many of you got student loan debt? How come you shitting on me when I charge people for knowledge? How many of you in student loan debt? Did you cry and complain to them? Why they charge you for new books every semester? They don't keep the same books and say, yo, I can give this to my homie. My homie gonna be in this college next year. No, you share those books, they're gonna be asked out because they changed the books. They make the effort to change the content in the books so they can't get passed down, not even from one year to the next, one semester to the next. How about that one? That's the hustle. <clears throat> Wells Fargo can send us all emails. Yeah, we got caught stealing monies, over $3 million, this and the third. Uh, we, it's class action suit, so we do this person, if this happened to you. But guess what? Ain't nobody slowed down opening up bank accounts. Bank of America get caught out there and all sorts of mortgage fraud every year. Every year, I swear there's an email coming, boom. We got caught out there for some more mortgage fraud. Millions of dollars. You don't see Negroes going through way to protest and shut that down. But let a black man look like he making enough money. Everybody gonna be super critical. And if somebody don't even receive a book, I had people report me to the feds because they didn't get books. Send me in pride. Send, send me proud. Look, you know, I'm just letting you know, I sent this to the feds. I had people clone my website. Clone my website and solicit 
my material. I have people clone my Facebook, just like my page. I like their page, boom. Next thing you know, there's another Brother Polite Facebook. I've never sold by way of Facebook ever. I have a Facebook page with people soliciting sales. And if those of you that's out there who got large followings, you know that people be like, just like my page and then I'll send you some money and I'll uh, through PayPal, whatever. I'm, I got the money right now. All I want you to do is like my page and then I'm gonna buy uh, your page so I can also do my thing for marketing. Or oh, we'll borrow your page, we'll rent your page. It's that, yo, I got plenty of emails right now. If I just type in the keywords, just like my page, you see, one day I had to look it up. Like, yo, what this mean? Just like my page. I wrote like my page scan and it all came out. All you gotta do is like people's page, they clone your whole thing, they got access to all your friends and they impersonate you for as long as they can. Facts. People know how to make IP addresses disappear and all sorts of stuff. Yo, it's a, we in the technological era, it's crazy. By the time we catch up to all the game, they got a whole new game for us. It's crazy out here. But you know why people, they, they won't admit. The whole reason I'm really mad at you because you're living better than me. They won't admit that. They won't never say that. They make it about everything else, but they don't put the same effort towards student loan and they owe 20, 30, $40,000 in debt. A lot of people's life is over right now. Unless they get the information that I'm holding or, or somebody who has something reminiscent to that of what I have, their life is done. They ain't coming back from $40,000 debt. They don't even know what to do themselves. A lot of people depressed about it. $30,000, did you ever ask for a refund for your student loan? They never came through on the delivery what they said that you would get in light of the fact that if you get this information and you do this for a certain duration of time. No, some of them made sure you got a job just so you can pay them back the debt. So what's that? You're not even making the full wage from your job because you're over here paying these people back. Some of you get your student loan money and all this other stuff, and guess what you do? Say where you don't buy sneakers and shirts and all sorts of stuff. I know so many in the hood, because we lacking so much when we get some of that student loan money I forgot what they got, uh, student aid or whatever they call that. Yo, my sister did it. Everybody was like, yo, you know, I'm just get a couple of, you know, a couple of kicks of clothes and I'm like, you know, get right for college. That's insane. But you know what? We don't have nothing. So we got to actually make decisions like, yo, I know this for my education, but yo, the mics, the 16s just came out. You know what I'm saying? It ain't going to hurt because my books, I still got book money right here, but we always get caught up. <clears throat> it's real talk out here. So wait, you want to talk to me about if I want to buy a nice car? You want to talk to me? About, no, I'm going to get my nice car. Like I said, I ain't have a childhood of mine. I never had a childhood. You feel what I'm saying? And now <clears throat> I got to get what little childhood I can get, or little things that I wanted for my childhood while I'm an adult. And you want to say, man, you sick. You should grow up. You should get out of that. Grow out of what? I'm, I'm looking to grow out of poverty. I'm looking to grow out of poverty. That's what I'm growing out of. I ain't got no time for nothing else. Growing out of poverty. Grow up. What do you mean? Cause I want to drive a nice car. Oh, you know, people that say you drive that white man's car, like Toyota ain't a white man's car. You feel me? Like them Corollas ain't a white man's car. Just tell the truth. You make my car costs a lot of money. Oh, you wearing white man Versace shoes and you wearing white man Payless shoes. Still white man's company. So, so it's white when it costs a certain amount of money. You, you feel me? And somehow it's black when it's cheaper. Just let's address the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is you're just mad because it costs more. Because shit is all white at the end of the day. Negro something, yo, why don't you just get a black, black owned car? Where is it at? Yo, I hear Ghana's working on one. So I'm supposed to import a car from Ghana that's not even created yet. Yo, stop this. Yo, we buy black when we could buy black. But yo, we also got the right. I'm into art. You're not gonna tell me that there's not great art forms that come from people that are non-black. I'm into art. See, y'all tripping. I'm not gonna let someone limit me on my own expression. Art and sex, they're all synonymous. Mood, color, vibration, they're all synonymous. And we can integrate any of these things. A lot of y'all lost y'all soul. Soul, etymologically means psyche. Psyche is your mind. A lot of y'all lost y'all soul, lost y'all mind. Cause you get lost in the Maya of all this racial animus that's being perpetrated against you. So now you trying to facilitate racism, you can't even do it properly. Cause racism, in order for you to employ racism properly, you have to have an institution. See, I can't be racist, okay? I, I can be a bigot, you know, I can discriminate, I can do all of that, but I, I ain't got the power to be racist. I don't got institutions where I can lock people up and massively incarcerate them from the rules and the policies that I put out there. I don't have that. I don't have an educational system where I can dictate to people that we formerly enslaved on how to read and how to write and, and what credentials they can get to get into my populated schools by my race. I don't have that. You feel me? So a lot of you 
attempting to practice racism and you can't because we don't have institutions and for you to be racist you have to have institutions to properly facilitate it these are facts so until you got your own police department until we run in legislature legislature till we really got a control of the judiciary system i don't want to hear black people attempting to be racist <clears throat> live your life because like i said at the end of the day you talking to someone who didn't have much. So when they say, yo, you act like you ain't never had nothing. When you do your post and you showing off, that's because I didn't. You mad hype just because you got a Rolls Royce? Absolutely. I won't even know how to lie about those things. I am hype. Absolutely. You act like you never had nothing. Never did. What are you, what are you trying to do? Remind me of what I didn't have? I remind you every time I show off. I ain't never had before. And I'm enjoying it. But I don't show off to tear you down. But two people receive it two different ways. Sometimes you happy about what you got. Like we used to go to school, grandma give me some money for Easter shopping. You know what we do? We stand in the hallway a little longer, go to class a little later, we wear our shoes. We want everybody to see our new shoes. Everybody come back from Easter shopping. Everybody got their pants. Grandma mad at me. She give me like $600. I get one pair of shoes, one pair of pants. She like, yo, what's the shopping ticket? What's the shopping that took place? You put you you rolled the dice on one shoes. One, yo, you better turn that in. I'm like, babe, Grandma, I'm gonna turn it in. But but after a week, let me at least let them see me in this. Then I cash out and I buy a whole bunch of cheaper pants. But I gotta let everybody see what this look like right now. Everybody was doing that. Everybody was putting a lot of bank on one shoe. You you feel what I'm saying? In one pants, just to come to school and finally say we had something. This is what we had to do. So now I'm in a, I'm in a day and era where I can get as much as them as I wanted. I'll teach. If you don't burn out your desires, your desires will burn you out. They call it materialism. I call it materialization. I once sat there in my mind and I said, one day I'm gonna be able to get any of the expensive cars I ever conceived of having. I thought of it and I said, I'm gonna drive that. While other people said, man, you're never gonna get that. I thought of it. Now it has come to fruition. You call it materialism. I call that materialization because it was a preconceived notion that no one could see or feel it was intangible. And now it has come to the physical realm. I thought it up before it even manifested. So for you, it's materialism because you mad at clothes and you mad at cars. I'm not mad at these objects. These things are not even alive, they're inanimate. But for me, I'm saying, yo, as a child, I seen this coming and people told me it wouldn't. And now it's here. So for you, it's just materialism. Me, when I drive my Rolls Royce, I'm like, this is spiritual. Cause I made this manifest mentally. So guess what happens? I say, man, if I can make the Rolls Royce manifest, if I can make the nice house manifest, if I can make the beautiful women I'm associated with that uplift me manifest, what else can I manifest? So then my endeavor gets higher and larger and now I start thinking about the whole, now I start thinking about the community. Cause guess what? If you don't burn out your desires, your desires burn you out, like I said. So guess what? I've had my taste of the good life, so to speak. So now I don't chase it no more. I had it already. I had it. I'm done with it. I don't need it no more. You see? So people say they're spiritual because they don't have it. I don't, I'm not into that. I'm not, no, you're spiritual by default in that context because you don't have the resources to acquire any of those things. I have the resources to acquire. So now I know who I am. Because if some of you got the type of monies I was able to touch, you would have cheated on your wives a long time ago. You would have got yourself sick having so much sex with so many wild sisters who are inconsistent in relationships <laughs> you have been sick by now i have a great deal of discipline you know why because i've afforded myself the opportunity to be successful so i could be tried so i could be proven the number one thing the best thing that anyone can do on planet earth right now is to achieve monetary success so they can find out who they really are some of you are killers and never killed nobody before because you're just afraid to get locked up, not afraid to actually take a life. Some of you are drug dealers, never sold drugs before. You just was afraid of the consequence of getting incarcerated or possibly killed. It, it don't, some of you are no different than the people who actually commit the crimes. Just people who commit the crimes got more heart. But, but many of you think murderous. And many of you think like drug dealers. <clears throat> many of you are cheaters and put, in a, and put in a position to manipulate your power or abuse people you would. So I'm saying that's why people are afraid of success. You ever heard that before? People are scared of success. People are scared of success because they're afraid of who they might become. So every time they get close to the opportunity to be successful, no, nah, I'm not into that. No, I don't deal with that. I'm like, yo, you really complacent with living like that? Yeah, because they're afraid. If given the opportunity to be in a new environment and cross that threshold, they may never come back to where they really are. 
I took a risk. The biggest risk you ever take in your life is to be successful. Ain't no other risk on planet Earth. Ain't no other risk. We only take wins like we learned by our ancestors or learns. It's wins and learns. That's the L. It's no losses. Wins and learns. No losses. The biggest risk you ever take in your life is to be successful. Because once you're successful, you're going to find out who you really are. You're going to find out if you can be a committed man or a committed woman. You're going to find out if you can keep friends consistently. You're going to find out if you disrespect people because you have more. You're going to find out if you care about your community and you will still go back into your community after you make money. You're going to find out if you still will do things for free. The biggest risk you ever take is to be successful. Because a lot of people will never be the same. And with a little bit of success that we've managed to have, we've changed. And the worst thing about people is to watch other people succeed and want to stop it instead of appreciate it. That's why I said there's two different types of people. I can say, hey, I'm proud of this new house I got. And you know what people do? Two people. One person says, I'm proud of you, brother. The other person says, stop showing up. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? One person says, I'm proud of you. The other one says, we don't care about that. Stop showing that stuff off. Get a new car. I'm not supposed to be happy at a new car. Come on, you get a raise, you happy. You get new clothes, you happy. Someone gives you a gift, you happy. But I can't be happy because of what my gifts cost. I'm not supposed to be happy. No, I want to be happy too. I, if I was, if I was in a Honda Accord doing a live stream, hey, I'm taking the family out. People were like, yo, you a teacher? How come you driving that? I had it said to me when I was coming up. Now I could be in my Ghost or my I8. Look at this Negro showing off. You can't win without people. You can't win. If you ain't got, you need to get it because I ain't convinced. You do get it. I'm mad you got it. So what? I'm already convinced. <laughs> you can't win. So we learn we got to do this for ourselves. You feel me? So uh, that's why that's why I'm in boss mode. I'm in boss mode for all the young brothers and sisters that were subject to the same circumstances I was subject to, but the people in the community was too afraid to pull them out of shirt. The people in the community either had great hearts with no resources. The people who had resources were in the community. So what happens is, <clears throat> look, how the, look, look at the conundrum that we in. A lot of people mean well for the community. Tell you stop gangbanging, tell you stop drug dealing, tell you stop hustling. But when you go to them and say, what can I do to supplant this activity? Because I'm not even asking to be rich, family. I'm just asking to be able to stay alive, sustain myself. Mm. They can't give you nothing. So I go in the dictionary and I look up the word spiritualities. Anybody can look up the word spiritualities. And spiritualities is property acquired by the church or the revenue generated thereof. So I realize how spiritual I am. The more real estate I get and the more revenue I generate, I become more and more spiritual. I don't make up these words. So then I say, dang, black people practicing a, a backwards form of spirituality because they think <clears throat> just praise and aimlessly spirituality. But according to the language, spirituality is acquired property or revenue generated. That changed my perspective. Then I'm like, dang, I've lost my spirit because I was poor. See, I don't make this stuff up. These are words you can look up. So then I'm saying, who taught us this other form of spirituality? When that collection play go around, the person responsible for the play going around is spiritual. When the new church gets set up, the person responsible for the erection of that church is spiritual. The people giving, they're losing their spirit each time. You know what I'm saying? Don't give towards the cause. I know a lot of churches do a lot of good things, but just listen to me and don't take it out of context. We're lacking in spirit because we're lacking in economics in our community. If you talk about black empowerment, we cannot have a conversation about black empowerment void of economics. So when I talk to you about bossing up, bossing up is being able to tell you the right thing to do and also show you that I'm living a good life in the process. Bossing up is saying, I understand my people. My people need to see that I'm doing good in order for them to be motivated that they can do good too. Who wants to know all the powerful things that exist on planet earth and the metaphysics and the spiritual world that people tell you about the sun, moon and stars and they tell you about God and everything. And the person telling it to you can't even change their paradigm to transcend poverty. Who wants to know that? It's a huge disappointment to listen to someone for motivational purposes only to find out that they themselves are struggling. They themselves can't get out of poverty. You mean to tell me you got all this knowledge and you commit all these things to memory and you can tell me everything about DNA. You can tell me about the sun, the moon, and stars. You can tell me about Anilam, Anitaka, Mintaka and how that belt of Orion is aligned with Khufu Khafre and Miku Awe, the three pyramids at Giza. You can tell me how the Milky Way is aligned with the Nile. You can tell me how the Sphinx 
is aligned with the Leo constellation. You can drop all this math and all this science. You can tell me about Sirius B and Botolo and the doggones. You can tell me about all this information. You can tell me about the pyramids of planet Earth all being on the northern tropic of Cancer, the 32 to blind degree of latitude. All over the world, we'll say, dang, all these pyramidal structures happen to find themselves, or most of them, on the 32 degree line of latitude. We drop all this knowledge about that's who they were and that's who we are and we was able to accomplish all these things then and therefore we are these people now you mean to tell me that after all that information we don't got a formula for how to get out of poverty after all that information we don't got a formula for how to get out the project then we'll go with the information in the first place so after you tell me to kill the white man or hate the white man put boots on the ground He's a damn cracker. After you tell me all that information and I still live in the project and I'm listening to you every day, giving all my time, my attention, my focus, my energy to you. And my wives got to see me listening to you and my children got to see me listening to you. And after I watch lecture after lecture and after I patronize and see you in person over and over one year to the next, my life doesn't change because the message isn't being actualized. The message isn't showing me how to employ a methodology that works to my better my betterment or my upliftment whereby I can empower my family, where I can empower my wife, where I can empower my children, where they can say, you know what, daddy, I want to be conscious too, because ever since you've been listening to this information, our lives have been better. I can give them the spiritual jazz and say, you know, you know, we feel better about ourselves and, you know, we're moral. Ain't nobody going to be moral when they lack the resources. I don't care how good you teach your children to be. Once they ain't got what they want, they will become criminals. And like I said, you don't got to commit the crime to be a criminal in my world. In my world, you judge by your intentions, not your actions. And I don't got to know your intentions. That's your own mind. That's your own spiritual balance and order. I don't know what's in your heart and your mind, but you ain't going to tell me when you lacking, you don't think negative. You're not going to tell me that. Some of us just ain't got the heart to materialize the negative thoughts. Some of us have a lot of discipline to be more patient, but it manifests itself in negative attitude. It manifests itself in gluttony. It matter yes, your, your appetite is precipitated by your emotions. If your emotions go unresolved for a long period of time, that transmigrates into disease. So it's emotions, appetite, and disease. So if I have something incurring stress, possibly because of my living situation, I'm going to have an appetite for something. So if I feel like, you know what? I'm missing my mother, I'm missing my father, I feel like I'm being love deprived, I'm gonna have a craving for sugar. So the emotions offset a craving for sugar. So in order to suppress that anxiety temporarily, I'm gonna have to indulge in sugar. So maybe I get it through cigarettes, which they put plum juice and maple syrup in it. That's what makes the cigarettes addictive. Maybe I want crack, which is like a condensed version. Them 1212 Slims is a domino bag of sugar, just condensed. Maybe I want cocaine, because that's high in sugar as well. You quit cutting it to dilute some of the sugar. That's what it is, the fish scale. Maybe that's what it is, but guess what? At the end of the day, we're smoking crack, we're doing coke lines, we're smoking cigarettes because we feel love deprived. So love corresponds with the appetite for sugar or the craving for sugar. And if these emotions go unresolved and they remain pending and persistent, then what's going to happen is you're going to overindulge in it. And now your pancreas is going to have to suffer the consequence of trying of attempting to produce too much insulin to arrest all this sugar and then in turn the liver is going to also have to pay the consequence because the liver is like the prison the sugar that's coming in are the criminals and the insulin are the police and all of this is wear and tear and then your pancreas goes into decline and then now you're deficient and now you need chrome to replace this activity so your pancreas can produce more insulin all over again but all of this came from the appetite of sugar corresponding from a lack of feeling like you're being loved and we can do the same thing with sex you got sexual anxiety. if you're feeling sexually anxious you might crave some fish <clears throat> aphrodisiac you feel what i'm saying if you're feeling like you know i'm nervous i might lose my house i can't pay my phone bill anxiety corresponds with that which is crunchy you might bite your, your fingernails right all crunchy foods are saturated and all and normally accompanied by sugar. So when you see all the wound cancer in the community and prostate cancer in the community, that comes from all the crunchy foods that's saturated and all that's accompanied by salt. When you see all the high blood pressure, this is all from the anxiety of, oh man, I'm about to lose my house. Oh, it's about to be foreclosed. Oh, I won't be able to pay my phone bill. Oh, I think wife is going to have to leave me. But, oh, so now your wife might leave you because of economic issues and she's not giving you no sex. So now you want fish and chips. The chips is fried all salty fish for the sexual anxiety now you got to crave fish chips you can't stop eating it all the time 
once the emotions subside, you don't even have the craving no more. But we didn't get to the part of the healing to realize that the appetite has its inception in emotions that go unresolved. When we resolve the emotions, we no longer have the appetite for these things. It's just real talk. <clears throat> so I talk to you as a mad scientist. Cause say things people, most people on planet Earth don't even care about. That should care about. But it don't change the fact that it's true. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? So we talk about bossing up, we talk about getting the right information holistically. So uh, it's not enough to just say, you know, I want you to eat right. You also got to associate, associate yourself with the right people. Because if you don't associate yourself with the right people, you wind up producing the same toxins that you're looking to avoid through the bad foods because your body will create it. So you get upset, you get real angry, it causes electron out of the outermost valence of the sodium atom to shoot off. And then you got the chlorine or chloride that's in your body as well. So then the sodium says, yeah, I gotta find something to balance with as soon as possible. So, it, so the sodium covalently bonds with chlorine because you was angry and it caused the electrons to thrust off. So it's unstable, so it has to covalently bond with another atom. So when it gets together, boom, now you form NaCl. What is NaCl? That's table salt. So now you salty. That's what we say, right? It's subconscious. When you get upset, you act salty. So now what's happening is when you get angry, you're producing table salt. Too much salt causes what? Your blood pressure to rise. So if you're around people, you got the best diet in the world, but you're around people that get you upset. Then people make you sick too. You go to job, you don't like your job, people get you upset there. Yeah, your job making you sick. So guess what? A lot of vegans eat good and they be like, man, I don't understand why I'm sick. I'm about to go back start eating this regular food. I think I ain't getting enough nutrients. No, your environment also could be making you sick. So you have to holistically approach this thing the right way. But what if you're not getting enough sun? Because whenever you go to work, you got to go to work when it's dark and you get off of work when it's dark. You don't get it, the sunlight. And then when you do have lunch break and you walk, the skyscrapers are they blocking the sun, scraping the sky, so to speak, metaphor. So now what's going to happen is what? Oh, it's figurative. So now what's going to happen is what? You don't get enough of the sun spectrum. So now you're not getting enough vitamin D. 90% of America is vitamin D deficient. And if you're vitamin D deficient, then that means you're going to be high in anxiety, high in stress. It can offset suicide and things of that nature. So what part of the diet is exclusive to food? That's a lie. That's a farce. That's one of the biggest misconceptions in the world. People can make you sick. The environment makes you sick. Going to the job can make you sick. Not getting enough sun is part of your diet. You need to consume sunlight as well because 19 forms of the spectrum from the sun that you get. And most of us don't get the moon spectrum. The moon is not a luminescent body of itself. It gets its light from the sun. These are all facts. These are all facts. So you can walk around here and this stuff will actually make you crazy. Not because you're taking it all in, but because how much people are not listening to it. And it start making you think, am I tripping or I'm wilding because I care about this? But once you start introspecting, once you start giving back to yourself truly, then you start realizing, oh, whoa, whoa. This now is the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. It's the best thing. And that's bossing up. Bossing up is knowing how much is too much. We like to hear information that caters to us. Yeah, you got melanin. Yeah, you powerful. Yeah, you black. Yeah, we created all this. Yeah, the Caucasian stole all that from you. Oh, word? Since he did all of that, we should be able to come up like this overnight. If that's true. Facts. But that's not the case, is it? But... I bet you people will pay to hear their ego stroke over and over and over again. They'll pay for that over and over again. But someone tells you, yo, you gotta hold yourself accountable. Look, I ain't calling white people the devil in my time. We've been the devil to ourselves not doing it. Oh, black man, no, nah, you you simping. Oh, you cooning. Oh, you it's all these things. Don't you dare hold your own people accountable. They'll call you all sorts of names when they kill you, attack you, set up lynch mobs for you, get you out of here, call you an agent. Yo, it's ridiculous. No, give me back more of that information. We didn't even verify all of it. All, we, all they got to do is just sound true and sound like you mean well by us. We, we rocking with that person forever. That person don't teach you how to come out of poverty. That person don't give you no economic plan, no endeavors, nothing. Nothing. The man told me that the Bible's going to be our way out. Because all we got to read this Bible and we're going to be out. The other guy over here, he has a business proposal. He has an economic, he has an executive summary. He has a mission statement. Here's a projection. This is what we look like in six months. This is what we look like in one year. This is what we look like in two years. This is what we look like in five. Versus the person here who's saying, you know, the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> it sounds cool. <laughs> sounds dope. Really, it does. It sounds good. And it's not a knock to your spirituality, but we know what that is now. But it's not a knock to what you call in your spirituality. The reality is we need an actual plan. We got to actualize this information. It has to be quantified. There has to be a qualitative and quantitative property that corresponds with it in order for us to properly be able to facilitate a means to which we can come up. It's fact. We're not going to get out of this cheating ourselves out of mathematics and science. We're only going to get out using math and science. That's what you've been bragging about for years that we've done as a race in the past. How you think it's going to be any different now? 
<laughs> so that's what it is. I'm Brother Polite, head of the crown, illustrious Supreme Grand, at perception of our new covenant community. You know, we in boss mode all the time. I, I hope you understand what I mean by boss mode holistically. You know, we got to embody boss mode. It's not enough to know the truth, but you got to demonstrate it. It's not enough to be able to demonstrate it. People got to be able to look at you in your life and see that you honestly are happy and content with your life. And if you are content with your life and you are happy and you're ambitious and you know from one year to the next, you can make a distinction between the two and you can say, I get better every year. Then you're in boss mode. You're in boss mode. I eat for my purpose. I drink for my purpose. I live for my purpose. You know, just like a boxer has a certain regimen that they have to ascribe to in order to perform at their best should be the reason why you eat and you drink what you drink to perform at your best to get the best results you see but if you don't know your purpose then you eat anything if you don't know your purpose you drink anything if you don't know your purpose you hang out with anybody you have purpose a boxer that has purpose hangs out with those he has to spar with stays in the culture when he goes to events they normally boxing related events keeps himself in the zone or let me see what the competition looks like if you have purpose you behave as such and therefore you don't waste time you don't waste conversation you don't waste consumption everything is about that purpose until you see it come to fruition and when that happens that's not enough we on to the next ambition then you might have tweaked your regimen a little bit i exercise for my purpose i eat for my purpose i associate for my purpose i network for my purpose i drink for my purpose that's what it is everything is about branding you know, anything I do is about branding. Everywhere I go is about branding. I am the brand. Stop separating yourself from your company. If you made yourself your company, you will respect it a whole lot more and you will do better by it. You keep separating yourself from your company. <laughs> you over here, your company over there. That's where the problem is at. You are your company. Your company should become so successful it is you. So think of it like that right now. It was all love. Like I said, brother, like head of crown, luscious, supreme grand, exception of our new covenant community. We're in boss mode. I really appreciate you, my brother. I love your brand. I love what you bring to the table. I love your professionalism. He's clearly success. When you see this video and you see how it comes on, you know that this person is serious about their success. You can tell they respect themselves just through their presentation. How much do you respect you? Are you content just because you can get the video up and upload it? Or do you put the extra incentive out there to make the distinction amongst you? And those who may not be that serious. <clears throat> That's what it is. Where everybody else put markers on their DVDs with their titles. I was the one that burnt the images into my disc when I came to this community. Everyone else ripped off a piece of paper, there's no back. Some people just put it in a little paper slide. Me, I gave you a front, back, a narrative in the back, give you a synopsis of what this DVD is gonna be about. You open it, you get a promotion for other list of titles that I have, and you see the image burnt on the disc with my website. It's just the way I represent myself. I got respect for me. I respect me. So when you get my product, it should be an extension of me because I am my product. If I make a distinction amongst me and my product, then clearly you will see I respect me more than my product. So I have to be my product so my product can be an extension of me. So by the time you get me in your hands, I feel comfortable that I'm being properly represented. <laughs> That's boss mode, the effort that you put forward. You know what I'm saying? Like you never stop if you are your product and every day throughout the day. You're always making adjustments and tweaking. You're always getting the extra information you need. You're always upgrading. It never stops because you are your product. I'm a product of my environment. Now I'm putting products in my environment. Facts. <laughs> Let's talk. I'm with it, man. <laughs>